You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. I'm dyslexic, so I always struggled in school. Um, I was taking out some of my classes with a couple of other my mates, you know, having to read different books and practice spellings and things like that, but um, it never stopped me from doing anything what I wanted to do. I've never wanted to work for anybody else. I've always, like, as it, I don't know why, I don't know where it's come from, but being a young lad, growing up, I just thought, I could see my mates going out working hard 12 hour days, bumping tiles up on roofs, like grafting for like 30 quid a day. And I, f and I used to look at that observantly and I used to just think, uh, the guy who he's working for, is earning all the money. There's no chance I'm working for someone and earning them money. I just, from being a young lad, so I've, I've always wanted to do things for, for myself. It's been so far a little bit of a, stop and start up and down professional career really because you know I had to take time out earlier in my career because of because my dad got diagnosed with that and it hit me hard like it was a real shock to me I was going to the gym and I was sparring and I was I wanted them to hit me and hurt me you know and I was I was crying behind my gloves with frustration and just what was going on and I had to take time out because I can't be going in the ring sparring and wanting to get hit and wanting to feel pain and crying behind my gloves. Boom, we're on. Today's guest, we've got boxer Luke Campbell. How are we, brother? Yeah, I'm good. Yourself? Yeah, really good, thanks. Thanks for bringing us into your gym. Beautiful yeah, place. Good, good for you boys to be here. Yeah? How's yeah. life? Yeah. No complaints. Um, life is good. Obviously, my last fight didn't go as planned. And, um, you know, I had a few days of sulking. I was upset and whatnot. But, you know, we dust ourselves down and uh, we move on, don't we? Yeah, that's all you can do is just push on for the future. Phenomenal fight, which we'll touch on later in the interview. I always go back to the start with my guest, brother. Where did you grow up and how it all began? Yeah, so I, I grew up in Hull in Westall. And... Um, just your, you know, your average family. Um, I think there was four of us living in a three-bedroomed house. And, you know, it's normal. I played a little bit rugby growing up, rugby league. And then, for some reason, I wanted to go into boxing. No reason for it. Didn't know anybody that was involved in boxing. They didn't probably know a single, uh, any, a single boxer, but someone wanted me to go into boxing. Um, I was a... About, got to about the age of 13. I was a little short, chubby kid that played rugby. Um, went into the gym, really loved it. And um, from there, I just sort of just, I just kept going. Kept going from there. Lost about nine kilo and then started growing tall. So you're going to be fat ass? Yeah. <laughs> I was a second row rugby, rugby league player. Yeah. So I was one of the forwards. Mm -hmm. How was your schooling? Uh, yeah, it was all right. I'm, I'm dyslexic. So I always struggled in school. Um, I was taking out some of my classes with a couple of other my mates, you know, having to read different books and practice spellings and things like that. But um, it never stopped me from doing anything what I wanted to do. Yeah, it's mad that a lot of people, like sports stars I interview, a lot of them do struggle with dyslexia. They kind of find another because your schooling isn't what grains you into the person you become later on in life. and. Do you think that's one of the reasons why you became so successful? Were you ever laughed at or like, bullied at school? Uh, no, no, I, I'd like to say I was, I was lucky there. I, I never got laughed at. I, I think I never got laughed at or bullied for it, for it because I was never bothered about it. I was never shy that I had like uh, something that was stopping me from being with the rest of them. You know, I, was, I had what I had, dyslexia, it's not a big deal. Um, uh, and I never shied away from it, so I think being open on about it, it, it um, no one never mentioned it to me. What gym did you box in at Hull? So the first gym I was at was a gym called Fish Trades. <laughs> Bit of a weird <laughs> name, I know. Yeah. Um, but it's been, they had a lot of success 40 years ago, I guess. It's an old gym. So I started at that gym, Fish Trades. I had nine fights as an amateur there. 
um, and won only three. So after having one season there, I decided I need a better coach and I need a better gym where I can do some good sparring and progress. So then from there, I moved to St. Paul's, which is actually probably about a five minute walk from where we are. Because I know when you, when you speak about a defeat after a fight, you've not had many, but it fucking disheartens you. So how did that affect you then at a young age if you lost nine? Yeah, do you know what? Mad, because I look back on it now thinking, wow, I, I think I lost like five in a row at one point. And I just think, why did I carry on? What was driving me to keep going? But I think the passion of just wanting to be better every day was what kept kept me that kept me going, give me the drive to like, no, it's all right, I've, I've had a loss, but I don't want to lose, so I need to keep working harder. I need to get back in the gym and practice this and do that. I think that's it. Give me more drive. Mm -hmm. You've got one of the biggest amateur records in British history. I think is like yeah. over 150 fights. Why were you fighting so much? Is that just to keep constantly improving? No, really, it was. Um, it was one where I think in about 26 fights, I got onto the international scene. So I had about 26 fights at, at your gym locally and then doing championships. But then when I got picked for England, I started going away on tournaments. And when you start going away on tournaments, you could have three, four, five, six fights in a tournament in, in some of them. So I guess if you're going away on three or four tournaments a year, and you're having and you're winning goals and you and you're having three fights there or five fights there and five fights there and four fights then the numbers start adding up when did you start realizing you could have a career from boxing i think it got to 2008 um i actually didn't make the olympic team that year even though i was number one in the country for winning the abas why is that they, they sent another guy um who who qualified in the first tournament um, for th for that Olympics, for Beijing Olympics. So obviously I didn't I didn't get a, a chance to go there. But listen, everything happens for a reason. So later that year, I won the European Championships in Liverpool, and I was the first British man to do that in 47 years. I think from that point, I thought, yeah, I can I can mix it with the best. You know, I have I've got four years now for the next Olympics. I can mix it with the best and. I can do this. Was that your incentive then to go to the next Olympics of 12? Always. Uh, 2012? Always for the Olympics. I, I never thought about being a professional boxer, not once. Yeah, I, want, I wasn't particularly interested in that. What my goal was, was to be an Olympic champion. And you go that gold medal. How was life before that? Because I've spoke to a few boxers now and some of them have had two and three jobs to try and keep their head above water. How was your life running up before the Olympics? Yeah, so basically when I was, when I was on... Uh, GB camps, uh, or I was going, I was getting picked um, to go on top, um, training camps. So you you maybe get picked, like you get a letter through the door saying, yeah, you're down in Crystal Palace between this day and that day. Do you accept? And then you'll confirm it, and then you'll go there. But in between stuff like that, I used to, I've always wanted to work for myself. So I would, I'd go out knocking on people's doors, kind of wash your driveway, kind of clean your gutters, kind of wipe your windows, you know, things like that. So, because I'd always want to do it for myself. So I'd just do that in between. But it got to a certain point where I was doing that every day and I was also training at home, going through the ABA championships here. And I thought, listen, someone's got to give here because boxing became a little bit of a chore. So I was out trying to earn money. And then when I was, when I was finishing at the end of the day, I'd had to go straight to the gym. So it was long days. And then I was tired going to the gym and I just thought, I got a pick here, so I decided just to stop, stop working and then just fully concentrate on, on the amateurs and get going down to the GB camps and things like that and stop worrying about earning money. Um, you know, and I was, I was surviving on, after paying a couple of little bills here and there, paying my fuel down to Sheffield and back every week, I'd have like £30 a month to myself. So it became a bit of a game with me to see how much I could save instead of what I couldn't. What, what, what I couldn't spend and um, I just went with nothing yeah just to keep progressing just, and just, I just went with nothing did you have that belief though that you were going to be as successful that you are well what I did have was um, I had the belief that I knew I'd give it 100% no matter what happened whether I made it or I didn't I could live with myself 
and that was more important to me but giving a hundred percent and living with myself whether I got there or whether I didn't I could be happy with myself because I know I'd give it my best shot how was it when you got the call to go to the Olympics in 2012 in London your home fucking place basically well it, it wasn't so much of as getting a call because we was all on the GB camps and there was like three or four guys at each weight and we was all getting sent off to different tournaments all over the world and it was the one that was like performing at the tournaments bringing back the gold medals you know you might go to one one tournament you might get beaten that in the first round and then someone else in your weight has gone to a different tournament you might have won gold in that tournament and it, it's like you just had to show that you was winning goals and you was performing and then that in itself then they picked the best one then to go for the first qualifiers for the olympics which was the world championships in azerbaijan in 2011 obviously i was performing i was winning gold medals um so i got picked for that and then i went to that and qualified i got a silver medal in that and uh, i qualified for the olympics there how was the how was that feeling winning gold that there uh, were your favorite no no i think i Underdog. was like I think I was ranked number 43 in the world going into that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Were you going in there favourite though in your mind? Did you believe that you could bring home the gold? I believe if I... it's Getting a good draw is all, always helps. But I believe that if I got a good draw uh, first, that I can go on, I, I can win. You know, and I got beat in the final by two points by the Cuban. How did the... Is that your relationship with Anthony Joshua started? Um, when did that start? No, that started probably 2009. So way before? Yeah, like, like 2009, maybe the end of 2009 coming to 2010. I think that's when Joshua would come on the camps. And then we went to Europeans in Turkey together in 2010. Uh, Joshua got beat in that one. We all got beat in that one. I got robbed by the Turk in the quarterfinals for a medal. <laughs> you know, always getting fucked over by yeah, the judges. Always, <laughs> always. I, it happened to me so much. Sort of just, it sort of just became part and parcel. But I'm, f I'm in the European Championships in Turkey, fighting the Turk for a bronze medal, and they robbed me bland. I beat the Turk comfortable, and they give it to him. But that for me was a big moment because. I'd been winning gold medals all over the place. And if I'd have won a medal in that tournament, it puts my money up. Because the only chance you can get to put your money up on, on the Great Britain camps is if you win major medals at a, a Europeans, a Worlds, or Olympics, your medal goes up. So you're on certain funding. I think it's like D funding, C funding, B funding, and A funding. Of, I think A funding is like 2,200 a month tax free. Then it goes to 1,500. And then I think it goes to like Eight and a half, 850 quid a month and then like 400 and summit and I was on like I think I was on at the time 800 mu 850 quid a month so that them not giving me the decision from that mm -hmm. stopped me from going to be funding so I was gutted so it's survival mode as well when you're in the amateurs too the more obviously events you win the more funding that you get yeah exactly and a lot of people will probably fade their ways because they can't afford to they can't afford yeah. it yeah yeah. How many people were you in the amateurs with then, in the Olympics and stuff, to then? How many's kicked on in life? Do you know what? Um, I, I feel like the, the lads that I was, that, who I was with at GB, um, I've all gone on to do decent things um, in the pros or in life. Like, it was a real good mixture. Um, who did we have? Obviously, Anthony Joshua was there. Um, Josh Taylor, myself. Um, who else was there? Um, Tom Stalker, Charlie Edwards, Cal Yaffai. Um, that's just that's just a few. Anthony Agogo. I used to train with George Groves on the England camps. Um, Tyson Fury being to tournaments with him around the world in the early days of the England camps. Like, just like. Is that a good vibe? Or is it everybody alpha males? Everybody competing in. Yeah, sort of. I mean, everyone competes at their own weight. So, like, if me and you are on the training camps together and we're not at the same weights, then we could get on. If we liked each other as pals, yeah. we could get on real well. But if you was at the... No one never gelled 
if you was at the same weight as me, no matter if we was if we could have been good mates, we'd never gel because we're at the same weight. You know, that's that, constant competition. That's, that's just how it was. Yeah. You was my competition. You wanted my spot, what I want. How was life after you won the gold? Very different. In what way? Um, in, in a way that before the Olympics, I was a quiet person, private person, liked my own business to keep. You know, I was quiet, didn't like, I don't know, audiences and people knowing what I was doing and where I was going and things like that. Just a quiet person that just had his head down working towards the Olympics. And then all of a sudden, everybody knew who I was. And then social media was kicking off, like back there, just starting for myself. And then people like seeing where you was and I didn't know how to be myself. I didn't know how to, I didn't know how to act, how, how should I act? You know, it was, I think for the first like 10 months was really difficult for me to adjust, to adapt, to sort of figure out who I was like and who I was trying to portray I was on social media and things like that. Yeah, that's the difficult thing though, especially if you get shot into this, the spotlight, especially winning Olympic gold. Boxing's massive, like you tend to see a lot of the gold medalists who win at boxing end up superstars and it yeah. can be difficult because then everybody wants a piece of attention, they want your, your interviews, your stories, the, but then they dig about the dirt of the past and then yeah. you've got the fucking trolls online. How, were you, how was, was that a big major factor? On mentally, or did you enjoy yeah, it at some point? Just even just as, as such as walking into a place, seeing people look at you, and then sort of seeing people talk about you as you're walking past, like it's a bit, bit weird. <laughs> because I'm just I'm just your average man on the street. I don't see myself as nothing more. And why should I? Just because I've been successful in what I do, don't mean I'm I'm better than the next person. You know, so that for me was a lot to digest and, and to sort of get sort of used to it. People coming up, getting pictures with you and things like that. And I'd never wanted to get too big for my own boot. So I think I'm better than people when I'm not. I'm just the same as them. They go to work and put food on their family's table. And I just see myself doing the same thing. But man was in, but I had a lot of eyes on me doing it. That's the only thing different. Yeah. How long did it take you to go pro then after the Olympics? Um, I think I turned pro like, I'd like to say at least probably 10 months after. I didn't do anything. I, I went into a uh, TV show, Dancing on Ice. Got to the final? Got to the final, don't know how. Um, I think it was the great city of Hull what was ringing up <laughs> on the phone. And, and, uh, back in your corner? Back in me and, and keeping me in, to be honest. Um, got to the final in that. It was, it was a great experience. Really enjoyed doing it. Met some nice people in there. Um, and obviously, I grew my profile, you know. Which is the main objective. Give me the opportunity to grow my profile, get more well-known before I actually go into the pros. I was never wanting to turn pro. Mm -hmm. I, only did, I only turned pro because I just didn't want to live back with any regrets, thinking I didn't know what I was capable of. So you I seem very business-orientated. Sorry for cutting you off there, but you seem very right. business, business. Many businesses you got? Um, I've got about four. What have you got? But no one really knows. I don't know. <laughs> no, no one really knows. I've got, obviously, I've got Cool and Promotions, which is my main business. Um, I've got a property business. I've got a gym business now. And I've got a couple of little things what I'm working on, what I believe will be really good. I'm, I'm currently building a mental health app which I believe will help a lot of people. Well, that'd be massive. Very excited about that. I wish I could talk more about it, but I'm not there right yet. But um, I'm very passionate and excited about that. Where did you get that from, the, the breadhead mentality to make a crust and, and stay kind of grounded, to, um, to invest well? Yeah, I just, for one, I've, n I've, never, I've never wanted to work for anybody else. I've always, like... As it, I don't know why, I don't know where it's come from, but being a young lad growing up, I just thought, I could see my mates going out working hard 12 hour days, bumping tiles up on roofs, like grafting for like 30 quid a day. And I, and I used to look at that observantly and I used to just think, uh, the guy who he's working for, he's earning all the money. 
there's no chance I'm working for someone and earning them money. I just, from being a young lad, so I've, I've always wanted to do things for, for myself. And, you know, I, listen, I have worked at Asda before, pack, packing people's bags and cutting people's bread just to get a little bit of money in for Christmas so I could buy people presents. But other than that, I've always, I've always wanted that get up and drive and, and create something for myself. How hard was the dancing on ice thing? How was that to adapt to dancing around the ring to then doing it on skates? <laughs> Um, I think I had a, f- a fair few comments calling me Bambi on ice. <laughs> a fair few. <laughs> it was hard. Like, you know, it's like in the boxing, I, I was the, always the first in the gym and the last out. When we was doing the ice training for ice skating, I was always the last on the ice and the first yeah. one off. Just didn't have any passion in, in, in learning how to skate. But, you know, um, I'd, I'd picked it up. I did all right. I wasn't as good as a lot of the others, but I did all right. That's good though, but it's, yeah. it's different to to try and do new things, especially still young age and try to grow a brand and creating yeah. your name out there. And that's what it's all about, is utilising it to your advantage. The wave isn't always going to be there. No. So you've just grabbed your surfboard and done, fuck it, man, I'm just going to ride it. Got yeah. to the final, done well. Again, that would have enhanced your profile. Yeah. For some that it's then private. Did that, how did, you, how did that affect you again? Yeah, well, again, that was, that was all in the... That, I did that straight after the Olympics. So it was all in with it. And during that show, like, you know, there was celebrities in that show that have been celebrities for years and you used to watch them on your TV years ago and things like that and I just think like I I seen how they sort of lived with it and I thought there's a lot of these guys that live in live in their own little world here they live in a bubble but because I'm an athlete and I've come from nothing and I've grafted blood sweat and tears to get where I am like I feel like I was a little bit more real to reality where I feel like a couple of them wasn't wasn't with reality yeah because it can be, it's a weird life, getting yeah. attention. It's so weird that yeah, it really you, you can understand why people become recluses. You can understand why people turn to drinking drugs because it's the 100%. pressure of, I always say it, like the media and that kill people as well. And yeah. people that's in that life and that fucking bubble, as you say, it really does affect people mentally. I just think if you're like really famous, like, like I, I take my hat off to you because you, you need a certain quality to be able to handle it and, and, and live with it and treat people like, I guess if you, I mean, I'm on a very tiny scale um, to certain people out there. And like, I just think like, they, they've got it all the time. They can't even walk down to the street to get some milk and bread. Yeah, you know? that must really affect people. Yeah, it's Must really to. affect them. So when you turn pro then, what was your plans then? Um. I don't know. Are you just winging it? Just, yeah, <laughs> just time pro. But for, for me, is, I've always, if, I, if I'm going to do something, I want to be the best. You know, if whatever job you put me in, I'd want to be the best at that job. Um, and I guess that comes from boxing. So obviously, I, now I'm, I've turned pro. It's not the same as amateurs. It is different as you learn, as you, get, as you go along. And, you know, now I'm a pro. I want to be the best in the world as a pro. But you were at the. You came out the traps flying. You were knocking people out for fun. Yeah. So you did. You had everybody's massive hype. Next big thing. How again? Did that pressure come? Did you? Is it better being an underdog, or, or would you? Does people prefer to be favourite? Because you were coming yeah. out and just knocking people out. Yeah. Yeah. No. Um, I wasn't. It was. It was a strange time because I never. And I, I didn't know if I was going to be a puncher or not when I. You know when I was when I first temp professional I didn't know how I was going to be um, but yeah no, I, I seemed to be knocking guys out with the right hand and the left hand so which was good um, so yeah I think everything was going great up until the point where I boxed Mendy um, in my 12th fight and it just opened my eyes to a lot of things um, you know it's, as well as all the fans that I did have like for one I should have never been in the ring that night but I was, and that was my own fault for going through with it. Two, I didn't have a team around me that looked out for me. And the other thing that I noticed was, like, 
I don't know whether it's England or, or whether it's everywhere, but there were so many people that was happy to see you fail. Yeah, that's you know, that thing. was hard to digest from having all the people that was backing you and then all of a sudden you got beat and everybody's laughing at you. Like, it can be a, it can be a real brutal yeah. sport. Yeah, that's the, that's and I see it every day now, every weekend the boxing's on. To be honest, like, they're all loving one guy, you know, and then everybody's slating him. Yeah, it's sad. Like Josh Warrington fighting Saturday. I was gutted that was for one him, of the examples. I've got a lot of time for Just Josh. Opened your eyes. Like, everyone yeah. was loving Josh and he's 30, you know, and talking very highly of him. And then all of a sudden, it's boxing. He gets knocked out. He's give the fans, like, all all the entertainment in every one of his fights and they're all backing him and then he gets knocked out and then you see him getting slated by people and things like that and I just think it's just the brutality of but the I sport. I think that's where you separate the, the champions from the losers because people who go through that loss and come back, I believe he'll come back stronger. Yeah. it's um, That's where you separate it because then it's easy to put people back in their shell because it's a knock back down to earth, isn't it, when you're in a certain Massively, bubble. Yeah. That happens then probably for a few days you think fuck this it's too much I'll probably quit but real fighters will go nah for some of the fighters have had the biggest fighters and, and on this planet have had some serious losses but it's, oh, it's the coming back isn't oh, 100%. it's the boxer's mentality 100% and it's you know it's obviously it's in him what, what he wants to see but all them people that was commenting like me myself I've never commented bad about anybody on social media why would I pick out some guy and start dissing him for if anything I'd want to give him pos positivity so I was I was gutted for Josh yeah 2014 as well just when you start turned pro you, you wanted to take a break because your old boy was diagnosed with cancer yeah how did that affect you because uh, you seem very close with your dad in the videos yeah it's it's been so far a little bit of a stop and start up and down professional career really because you know I had to take time out earlier in my career because of because of my dad got diagnosed with that and it hit me hard. Like it was a real shock to me. I was going to the gym and I was sparring and I was, I wanted them to hit me and hurt me, you know, and I was, I was crying behind my gloves with frustration and just what was going on. And I had to take time out because I can't be going in the ring sparring and wanting to get hit and wanting to feel pain and crying behind my gloves. So I just needed to take time out. Is that like a bit of self-harming? Like try to get people to hurt you because you yeah, were in pain? Yeah, I guess because I was in pain mentally. You know, I, I wasn't bothered about getting hit and I'm stood there inspiring and I'm, I'm wanting them to hit me and hurt me. And I was just crying behind my gloves, not because they was hurting me, but just because frustration, yeah, I guess, and sadness. The thing in life, like you can born such a high, win the Olympic gold and turning pro and everybody loving you. And there's always those obstacles, and that's when it kind of makes you realise that this is what life's about. It's about mm. family and try to show some quality yeah. time yeah. to then find some balance. Because I'd imagine at your status that it can be like a whirlwind. Because you done was it your first um, belt was against was it Tommy Coyle? Yes. Yeah. Was that in the hole because it was he a friend? Yeah. And you, what stadium was that you fought in? So that was at, uh, that was in e Eastall mm -hmm. and it was um, that was in the whole KR rugby stadium. Was that real rivalry before it, it, it kind of... Do you know what? It certainly, it was, yeah. Um, people asked me, saying, oh, did you sort of, did you make it up? Was you, was you pretending? But it's one of those things like, we look back at that now uh, and we share that as a moment together. But back then it was... It was a lot of emotions flying through boxing. People acted out in ways that, you know, we wouldn't normally do, you know, because there was a lot of passion and desire and pride on the line for both of us. So, you know, it was all real what you saw um, between us. How was it winning the title? Oh, it was, it was amazing. How was it fighting outside as well? I loved it. Yeah, I had my debut outside in mm -hmm. Hull with about 8,000 fans there. And I think there was more there. There was certainly more there when me and Tommy called box because I think that was the first time Hull had ever seen anything like it. How hard is that though, being an old friend? Because you put him down a few times in a fight. 
even though he was hurt, you yeah. were still going in for the kill. But the, uh, how yeah. does that affect you as a boxer? Because everybody's got goodness and a soft side, but yeah. the, do you see that? Like, fuck me, just call the fight, or do you just try and go and do damage? I just thought, I, back then it was all about, you know, kill or be killed, really, in the ring. You know, that's the way you've got to see it. Like, And that's the thing that is breaking loose from the amateurs to the pros. Like, when you're in the amateurs, it's just... Um, it's a sport. It's a, it's, you know, it's a, it's a game of chess type thing. And but when you're in the pros, it's literally you just I've just got to hurt the shower. Yeah, like I've got to hurt you. You've got to go in there with a mindset is I've got to hurt him. You know, yeah. and that's that's a big difference from leaving the amateurs to going in the pros. But I spoke about this to Tommy last weekend actually, and. Um, it's the things about boxing where it can be the best sport in the world and the worst sport in the world because I, me, and, me and Tommy's talking together and I've gone on a one and then he and Tommy was suffering for months afterwards with depression and with pride being hurt and just in a in a very unhealthy place and that's the thing about boxing where it can be the best sport in the world and also can be the worst. Yeah, how did, because you lost your next, next fight, yeah. that was the first time you get put down. How did you say you shouldn't be there? Why was that? Just because I had a, I got an illness. I got a bug like 10 days out for the fight. I was weak as piss. It was like the lights was on, but no one was in. The preparation I had was, wasn't good. Wasn't good at all. I didn't have the correct team around me at the time. Um, well, I had no one around me really. No one there backing me. Um, and I, I mean, that fight was taken on three weeks' notice against a, a guy that no one really wants to fight. It was it was a fight where I was given where there was zero reward and very high risk. Um, and I just I wanted to get in there and get it over with. Just like I just didn't want to be in the ring that night. Um, should have never gone through with doing it. And but I did, and it is what it is, you know. It was still a very close fight. I still thought I nicked the fight, to be honest with you. I got told I needed to score and win the last two rounds to win the fight, and I did. And I, and I still didn't get it, but it is what it is. Um, everything happens for a reason, and that, I guess, from that defeat there, opened my eyes to a lot of things, what was going on around me, what wasn't going on, if you know what I mean. How does that affect you mentally? Because you spoke about Tommy losing that fight and getting himself into a depression. When you've been coming from such a high, undefeated, knocking people out, Olympic gold prior mm. to that, how does that then affect you? Yeah, um, I, again, yeah, I guess that really that did affect me in big ways because it's like I say, um, there was so I was surprised there was so many people happy to see me fail, like a lot, a lot of them was there happy to see me to lose and fail or get beat and. And I just thought, wow, like everybody was loving me one second previous and then now everybody's laughing at me and hating me because I got beat, you know. So, yeah, it was painful. Um, and then there was a lot of big decisions changed from that. You know, I went over to Miami, trained out there and went quiet from a year or two years on social media and everything. I was out the way from the press for two years, from the media, from my social media was quiet. Just went very quiet. Is that just to recharge, refocus, set new goals? Yeah, rebuild myself, I guess. Set new goals. I wanted to work in quietness and then I w I've always wanted my performances to scream louder than my words. How's uh, how do you is that the best thing you, you think you could have done then was move away? Is that when you were training with Freddie Roach? No, I was training with George LA. Rubio in Miami. Mm -hmm. I, I was I was out in Miami training with George Rubio, and um, you know, at the time it was all I knew. If I, you know, I wouldn't change anything because I met some amazing people in Miami, still friends to this day. Um, so I wouldn't change anything, but if I don't know, if I, it's, it's the thing, innit? If you know what you know now, back then, you'd be different. Like, I probably wouldn't have gone out to America and away from my family for, for 
that amount of time um, being away from the media and everything. I'd, what I should have done was I should have gone around a few different coaches in the UK and trained with a few and see where I fitted in and see where I liked. Um, that's ideally what I should have done. But because I'd tr done pads with George in the past, I saw I, he was the only person that I knew that, you know, I, I enjoyed training with him. But it was just a hell of a commitment. Yeah, feeling felt comfortable with him. But again, sometimes that's the best thing you can do. Yeah, it's just f fucking off away from it because it's all outside noise. It is an illusion. Yeah, but like it doesn't really make anything. How? Because I know you and your wife are re really close, and you've obviously got three sons. Congratulations on yeah. newborn as well. Thank you. How difficult is on on your partner when you're making these decisions? Oh, massively. Like she's backed me all the way. You know, and I couldn't have done it without her. Um, running the family at home, giving the kids everything they need, sorting the house out and just running everything. Like, I couldn't have been able to, to, you know, I'm I'm the one that's heading for my dreams and she's dropped what she's doing and she's backing me to go for my dreams and I couldn't do it without her. Do you think that makes a, a massive f part of your life that you've got somebody there that supports you to then kick on and, and be as successful? to have somebody that stands your corner instead of, because it can be difficult, it's a lonely fucking journey, but yeah. do you think that plays a massive part of on being successful, that you've oh, got somebody there you can trust? Yeah. 100%, yeah. Knowing that your family's good and everything's happy in there, you know, it's 100%, it makes you that more dr driven and, you know, you want to work that bit harder and you're a happier person once, you know, if you know you've got good, solid family behind you. How was that feeling getting your own back in Mende when you beat them? Yeah, good. I mean, it should have been that. Is that a relief? I o I knew I was going to beat Mende. I I always knew I could. I when I got in that ring when I first fought Mende, I was I shouldn't I shouldn't have been there. I was weak. I was drained. I was tired. The lights was on, but no one was in. Me turning up to to our I know I can be like a hundred percent in focus, good training camp, feeling good, feeling strong. Me fe feeling good to me feeling bad. He fought the weakest version of me, what I should have never shown him that night. And then me getting in the ring feeling good, it's a completely different story. And, you know, I think I I probably give him one or two rounds out of full 12 rounds, what, what he had success in. But let me tell you, Mendy is a hard, hard man. Yeah. Like, I think that guy is chiseled out of stone. I, and still to this day, no one wants to fight him. And I think he's won every fight since me beating him mm -hmm. at Wembley. You know, so I still give Mendy a hell of a lot of respect because he's tough and he's non-stop comes all night long. How was it, Linares? Linares. Linares. How was Linares' fight as well? Because that was a tough fight and on <laughs> scorecards you could have potentially won it. I thought I beat Linares. Yeah. I, and a hell of a lot of other people thought I beat him too. He's a tough too. bastard as well, do he's, he? he's a hard, hard man. You know, he's a, he's a three... Here's another thing, you know, I'm an Olympic champion from the UK with a good fan base. And then I have to go over to America to fight a freeweight world champion in his prime, because he was in his prime when I boxed him, on his show over in, the, over in America... And he was also ranked in the top ten pound for pound list. I had to go over there and fight him for that title. I honestly thought I beat him. I thought I won seven clear rounds out of a twelve round fight. Clear rounds. And that's giving him the, the extra round for the knockdown. You know. How how did that affect you again? Did, did you pick up because you you started you think you had a fight quick after that, did you know that? I um he dropped me in the second, didn't he? Yeah. And I, I had a little, them two rounds, I had a little slow start, and then when he dropped me, I thought, it wanted, I've never been dropped where I've been hurt. I've always been dropped through, I've been off balance. If someone's dropped me, it's, I've just they've knocked me clean off balance. I've got up, I've never been wobbled, my senses have always been there, and I've never been hurt. So, but as, as I threw a hook and leaned back, he hit me with a straight right hand and just knocked me straight on my ass, but I was completely fine. And then when I got up, I thought, I thought, you're embarrassing yourself here. I said, come on, let's go. That's what I said to myself in my head. And then from that third round, I thought I won One from the round. third to the 11th. Mm -hmm. He like just outboxed him, was hitting him constantly with the jabs. And yeah, 
I mean, the biggest relief after me, f after that fight was for me to actually get my dad died two weeks before that fight, so I was having panic panic attacks and everything, suffering with a little bit of anxiety and everything in for, in the last two weeks of build up for that fight. So that was really hard for me to go through. I used a hell of a lot of mental energy to stay in the moment. How was that when your dad died in, two, was it 2017? Uh, yeah, oh, horrible. I mean, I was, uh, I was away in Miami training at the time and I was on my own. So I didn't have fam and no family around me to talk to, cuddle to or anything like that. So I just had to literally turn off, turn everything off. The emotions, the thought process, everything, which was freaking hard. Yeah, but again, that, the memories that you'd have gave your old boy, man, from amateur career. Yeah. Won an Olympic gold, man. That, like, any boxer would give anything to have half of that yeah. career. Do you know what I mean? So it's the, we spoke earlier, and it, this is what life's about. It's all about creating memories. Yeah, and, massively. And it's to kick on. and It can be difficult, especially going through a training camp where... You know your old boys passing away. My dad was a semi passed away of leukemia, and you see them slipping. And mm. strong people just part of me always thought my dad would survive, even though he got three months to live. Yeah. I always thought he's I'll be fine. Yeah. And then when they go, you think, fuck me, man, it doesn't really hit you. To no. I don't think it's I've still accepted that. Yeah, it's you know my dad was on his deathbed three times where he'd be on there. They'd give him the end of life pack, and they'd come on and tell us, "Sir, listen, it could be any time now. It could be seconds." Could be minutes, could be an hour, any time. And he'd bounce back and be completely fine again. Three times I moaned for him in that state. So I never thought my dad was going anywhere when it come to it, you know. Um, because his mental state was unbelievable. Like, still teaches me now, like, the place he was in, and he's still in his head, he was not going anywhere. And he bounced back three times from being on, on the end of life pack three times so do you think that's where you get that fighting mentality yeah most definitely mentally yeah I definitely you know and what saddened me the most was my dad always said listen son I'm not going anywhere until you win a world title and it was two weeks before my first world title that saddened me the most that's what I couldn't get out of my head yeah but you've done the gold and I yeah I've done a lot I've done a lot but still as a person that always wants to achieve something like you 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 win you achieve one goal then you build a shelf above it and then you aim for the next you know you forget about your achievements that you've already done you just keep going for the ones that are in front of you not the ones that you've that you've got and that they're, they're behind you now because they're on the shelf how long did you take after that fight then did you take a layoff well not by choice um i fought him in september and i didn't get out in the ring till the, the till the may so I had, a, I had a long time out there again, but it went through, like, I'd just come off that fi great fight, fantastic entertainment, you know, high profile fight, and then he didn't put me out till March. Like, I was always ready to fight. Uh, I stayed in the gym, I stayed training, but I didn't get out till, fat, till Mar um, sorry, May, um, and it was literally, it was on a day's notice to fight. What? It's on a day's notice. So I wanted to fight, mm -hmm. and then they got me opponent one day before the, before the show, and I fought. So how, how was your relationship with Eddie Hearn? I mean, I think it's good. <laughs> but the way I'm like, I'm talking through this now, and I'm thinking, what's Eddie doing here? <laughs> Why has he put me against Mendy at the first start when I didn't need to be? And then, I've, then he tells me I've got to fight Linares with no other option. You know, and then from there, then I didn't get out till May. And then I end up fighting Lemachenko. <laughs> you know, but listen, it's, it is, I've always wanted to fight the best. I've never shied away from that. Yeah, and that's clear to see. And Eddie's so. always put me in with the best. <laughs> so it's fair play then, isn't it? So. You've, um, it's clear to see, obviously, with your last two fights against Lomachenko and then Garcia. Lomachenko says it's the best fight he's ever had. It's the toughest fight, especially with your reach and... Yeah. The power that you had for him. I don't know why he won so many rounds, if I'm honest as well. I'm not being biased, but you did win a few rounds. Yeah, I um, that, that how was it going into that fight? Yeah, that, that annoyed me as well, because it was a fantastic fight, great action. Yes, he won fair and square. 
not didn't state in that, but you know, I certainly won at least five of the rounds out of the twelve. You know, I th I think, um, but it was a great fight. It was fantastic. You know, Lemachenko is an un unbelievable fighter. You know, ranked number one pound for pound on the planet. But you know, I hurt him a few times and caused him a lot of problems. And you know, it was um, it was a fantastic fight for the fans. They they certainly got the the money's worth out of it. How was it going into the fight? Because it's a massive fight. It's a mega fight. Those ones, aren't they? You know, it was. Was there yeah, anything it was different a mega about fight. that? No, nothing was different. Still train. To be fair, the training camp was a little bit too long. How long? I had a hard twelve hard twelve weeks of work, which, for the way I am and my type of body, I didn't need twelve weeks. You know, I probably could have done with a nine week one. Can you overtrain then? Yeah. Oh, easy. And that's probably what I did a little bit. A little bit the last couple of weeks was, you know, I didn't need it. Um, but you live and you learn, don't you, as you, as you move on. But, um, yeah, it didn't change nothing, but everyone was writing me off. So, I mean, like, not only am I fighting the best guy pound for pound on the planet, everybody was also telling me I was getting knocked out in two rounds. Everyone. The likes of Johnny Nelson and the Sky team, they was all telling me more or less, not directly to my face. Well, a couple of them was, you know. Basically, one of them looking at me, telling me, how, how, how do you think you're going to win? I'm like, oh, I, yeah, I'm a Sky fighter. You should be at least backing me to my face. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> not, I just don't understand how you think you're going to win. You know, so there was uh, there was all that as well going into the fight. So how do you deal with that then? That like people on your own corner are kind of Lomachenko's a great fighter, but you kind of still think right, there's chances here. I would always think, even no matter who it was, there's always a possibility that some yeah. there's always upsets. But how much of an underdog were you going into that? Well, massive underdog. You got to bring a bit of macho out into you, and yeah, you got to bring a bit of macho and say grit your teeth and say right let's did that keep it. the fire then to last the distance and, and keep going and keep chipping away yeah because I don't think definitely. I think you're only one or there's only two that's went the distance with Lomachenko yeah yeah I think there was I think out of about 10 world champions he'd box I think he'd stop nine of them so um, yeah but I never wanted to be in there to say oh, I've gone the distance with him I've, I wanted to win I wanted to hurt him I wanted to win to be fair I should have put it on him more I should have pressed the fight gone forward and put it on him more instead of being looking to try and counter him and go on the back foot and then a the long layoff told the Garcia fight and then 16 months out the ring like it makes a big difference 16 months out the ring how long how was that how did that affect you mentally uh, a, 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 quite a bit, really. I mean, 16 months out the ring is a hell of a long time to go out the ring. But not only that, is I've got, like, it was 16 months since I made lightweight. You know, my body's naturally probably got bigger and grown and since, since making that weight. You know, if you're making that weight and you're bringing the weight back down a couple of times before that, it's not too bad, but... Just 16 months out of the ring was just a hell of a long time. Like being being involved, being in that in the fight frame of mind, and you know, and f being involved in fight weeks and having that pressure and the nerves and stuff like that. It was a long time since I, f I felt anything like that, and it was hard for me going. I went over to America for Christmas, away from my family. V very stressful for me on the inside. Hated it. Hit every second being away from my family over Christmas and things like that. How were you going? To, how you? How did you prepare for that fight then? Knowing that, again, more hate from this young kid who's yeah. potentially everyone saying is going to be the next pound for pound best fighter on the planet. Yeah, do you know what? To be fair, I had a lot of loyal fans myself backing me, um, which was good, and I, which I really appreciated. Obviously, he's got a hell of a lot of fans backing him. But yeah, I mean, I got COVID, what, five weeks before the fight, which didn't help, five or six weeks before the fight, which didn't help, you know. Um, I was, and that wiped me out for about 10, 11 days in bed with that. Um, and then having, having that, going then straight into a hard training camp, hammering my body again, 
Not ideal. Mm-hmm. Not ideal. There's always been little obstacles that I've had to jump over or or get by in in fights and. But you've camps. never turned away from them. You've still done them. Do you know no. what I mean? You've still stepped up to the plate. Like it doesn't matter what we. Everything you can learn from is you learn from the fucking losses and the darkness yeah. and the the mistakes. So get into that fight then, and you sparked him, put him on his ass the second round. Were you surprised or were you thinking I could have knocked him out anyway? Because you seemed, why did you, there was a, seemed to have been a hesitation when you put him in his ass. Yeah. Why was that? So I, I, I've seen comments say that, um, but let me tell you now, I've never seen someone spring up like him. He was like a jack in the box. He was up on the count of three and then the second the ref had wiped his gloves and whatever else and he was back in that centre, he was all there. So there's no, there's no chance I'm going to go, I'm going to go lunging in and uh, against someone that loves throwing his, his uh, left hook for me to walk on. I needed to be smart. And, I, and I'm a good finisher. And I can, uh, once I smell blood in the ring and weakness, I jump all over that. And he was fully back. Like, I've never seen anyone recover uh, and come back so quick from getting knocked down. Why like, do you think that is, young age? What, just I don't know. I don't know. But I've never seen anyone do that before. Like he, he bounced, and watching back, he was asleep. Like he was out cold. He hit the floor, woke up, and jumped straight back up. And I seen him like looking at like when the ref was counting at him. I was in the corner, and I could see the ref counting at him, and I could see him to his team talking to his team saying, "Ah, it's all good. It's good. I'm fine. I'm fine." Like he was calming his corner down. And, I'm fi- and then I thought, like, don't just lunge straight back in, Luke, because he's got good timing with that hook. If I just lunge in a little bit with attack and he throws that hook, then it's going gonna, it's gonna to turn the fight upside down. So I needed to be smart. How was it with the only 3,000 fans there? Because it's another super fight. So do you, do, you, do you like it that it's not as busy it's, or it, does it, it matter? Didn't, it didn't make the slightest bit of difference to me because every one of them 3,000 fans was cheering for him in Hill. It was all booing me. I, 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 I walked out the, to the ring with all of them booing me. <laughs> so, so for, for, you know, you say, how was it with 3,000 fans? I went from 20,000 fans in my last fight to then 3,000 fans, but then 3,000 fans was all booing me. <laughs> so it seemed like a lot yeah. of fans in there. This, was it a sixth or seventh round for the body shots? You've never been hurt with a body shot like that, have no, you? No, seventh, seventh round it was. Well, I watched the, I've watched the fight back once and seen it, and I've seen he threw that shot three times before that. And the one, it was nothing, like it landed and there was nothing, didn't affect me in the slightest. Um, and then obviously he was throwing it to the, to the head a lot. So as we exchanged and then he threw the shot, I just I covered up to the head and he just whipped it under my rib. And it didn't hurt me, bam, as it landed, it didn't hurt me. But then when I stepped back, I just couldn't grab my breath, just couldn't catch my breath. And I just, I just needed to go, to go down to catch my breath. Um, never been it like that. It, you know, it, as, as a person that wants to win and that's used to winning, and as a winning mentality, you know, it's, it really hurt me mentally I'm, and, and it hurt my pride because I didn't want to go out like that. I just couldn't. It was just a shot that I just, you know, couldn't do nothing about. Yeah, because a lot of people, a lot of people don't speak about body shots enough. I don't think that I'm how, a body how dangerous myself. they are, and to people, and yeah. that if you've never had one, then you, you know yourself like, how fucking dangerous they can yeah. be, man. And I when mean, people do them, you think how that doesn't look so. But it's I think, I've what? never like I've hit pe- loads of people with body shots and have gone down, and I've never just just thought oh, body bam. Like you don't feel it as yourself because you're the one that's landing it. But yeah. After that fight, he was in the dressing room and stuff, and he was asking, "Is this the best punches you've ever come out against? How are you feeling then? Because it was, it was not everything about raw for him to be well, asking those questions you, straight away. You're flying on emotions. You're, you know, sometimes you, you can speak a little bit out the box a little bit, and you know, adrenaline's going, emotions are flying, so. It's not the best time to, you know, to get caught on camera doing an interview. But 
you know, he's obviously he caught me with a shot. No one's never done that to me before. So the better the better man won that night. He, he, if he didn't land that shot, the fight could have been completely different. You know, I believe that I could have gone on and and really took him to pieces in the later rounds. But it's pointless me saying that because it's not what happened. P potential rematch. Listen, I'd 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 love it. I love it. I think it was a fantastic fight. The fans loved it. Um, it was a great action fight between me and him. And I think if we went for round two, I think it'd be another fantastic um, action fight. But for me, wanted things different, you know. For me, wanting, wanting it the other way around. Mm -hmm. Where do you go from here then for the future? I can go anywhere where I want to go. Yeah, that's what I like to hear. I'm in the driving seat. <laughs> I ain't got to answer to fucking no one. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm my own boss. I can do what I want. That's that's the position I'm in. I'm in. I'm fortunate to be in life because I can do what I want. If You know, I can continue boxing. If I want to do something else, I'll do something else. Like, I'm, I'm good for life. My family's good, happy. So I'm in a fantastic place. I'm in the driving seat and I can... I don't need to answer to anyone if I don't want to, you know. I've had, but there's still a lot of passion, there's still a lot of desire, there's still goals to be reached. Get so, a world title, eh? Yeah, I, like I say, there's still a lot in me that wants to achieve and win. So we'll see. We'll see. Who would you like to fight? Who's the name the best three fighters in the division? Lopez. Give me one of them. I've sparred a lot with Lopez in Miami. How is he? Yeah, he's a good fighter. I'd, I'd love that chance. And he knows I'm a good fighter. Mm -hmm. What about, could you go and fight Taylor? Yeah, possibility, yeah. Certainly, yeah. Do you think that could happen? Uh, I think there's a possibility. That would be a cracking fight. That would be a, an unbelievable yeah. fight. Um, that would be an unbelievable fight for the UK, me and Taylor. Your division is tasty though, eh? Yeah. It's the best division in the world. Yeah, it's, it's a tasty fucking With division, With the biggest man. names in yeah. the world. It's the biggest pussies as well, isn't it? That's what yeah. it's all about, man, is business. You've got the, a tattoo in your arm for the Olympics. What was, what's that? I forgot to touch on that earlier. Uh, I've got a tattoo on my ribs. Yeah, is that, that's, that the so, goddess? Yeah, so that's off the Olympic gold medal, mm -hmm. that, that tattoo. Everyone was getting the rings, and I thought... What's it? And then I, I thought about it and I was looking at the gold medal and I thought, you've got this gold medal now. Why don't you just get that tattooed on you, yeah. on you there? So I did. How was Freddie Roach to train with? Yeah, well, I didn't really do... I, I no, didn't do much with him? No, I, I went out there... I went out there for... I only went out there training for a couple of weeks as an amateur and, and did bits and bobs. But he, he, he actually wasn't there at the time. He was busy with other fighters but I trained in the gym seen all the fighters go in there did a little bit of pads with his brother um, and that was that so do you think then better rest a couple more fights this year then are you just going to go with the flow yeah well listen if I'm if I'm there I'm wanting to fight the best I want to be busy I don't want to I want to be busy I don't want to um, to be waiting around the talks of Joshua fight and Fury fighting June. Who are you picking? Um, going off last performances. Yeah. It's, it's always a difficult one. I mean, for one, this is why boxing's so exciting because you never know. I think Joshua, out of all the heavyweights, has the best chance of beating Tyson Fury. I think he's got the best chance of beating Tyson Fury out of them all. But Tyson Fury, he's on, he's on fire, he's on form, you know, and he's a fantastic heavyweight fighter. So, I'd probably edge it Tyson Fury, but I don't want to say that because Joshua, I, I love Joshua, he's a, he's a good guy, he's my friend. <laughs> but yeah. I don't know, it's, yeah, I'd probably edge Tyson Fury. It's a fight that everybody wants to see. Like, this is a thing with yourself as well. You want to fight the elite. Do you think a lot of boxers swerve big fights? Yeah, 100%. Why is that, though? Because they just, they just want to take the easiest fights and earn the money. A lot of them are lightweight. Who is it that's fighting the best? I mean, if you, if you don't have to. A lot of them now are talking about, 
uh, about fighting the best and yeah you know I, you gotta fight the best and this is what makes boxing exciting and then the next thing is the two top guys aren't fighting each other they're both fighting someone else that are of real relevance and it's just like you're talking it but you're not doing it you've got three sons do you think any of them potentially future world champion or do you want to keep them away from the sport um my my two sons at the moment and showed any interest in boxing. Are you relieved? Um, <laughs> yes and no. Yes and no. I am in one way. And then in another, I'm not because I could teach them to be the best. You know, with all my experience and everything, what I know, I could teach them to be the best. But then, um, but then another thing, you know, boxing's not everything. Boxing's not everything in life. So if they want to do something else and they have passion in something else and I'm, I'm, I'm all for backing what they want to do. Um, I don't know with my youngest son. We'll see. You know, never say never. So. I don't think the wife wants that. But, um, <laughs> Seen enough, has she? Yeah, one of them. I've got one son that's just mad for football, loves football. Um, what team? He, he's a Man City fan. Is he? Yeah. From Hull? He's a Man City fan. Um but he's in the whole city academy and he loves it. You know, he loves that competition. He loves football, which is crazy because I've never introduced it to him. Something he got himself and, you know, loves. And then the, my oldest son is a, is a good thinker. So we'll, we'll, I just got into golf with him. So, but just only for fun, you know. That's a great sport, golf. Yeah, Traveling we're doing the it world, together playing, as fun. You can play into your 70s and 80s. Nobody gets harmed. We, There's a good crust to yeah, make from it as exactly. well if you get pro. It's, um, exactly. Brother, I thoroughly enjoyed your conversation. But before we finish up, because I know you've got the mental health fat, which you can't touch on. But for anybody that's maybe in a struggle just now, maybe battling, because I know you've, you've battled yourself with yeah. losing your dad and coming back from defeat. What advice would you give for them? I just think... You know, there's a lot of people all, always with social media is what's going on there, searching for what everybody else is doing. And I think sometimes you've got to take a look at what you have got in life instead of looking at what, every, what you haven't got. Look at the things that you wouldn't change. Write a couple of things down every day, what you're grateful for, what, what you're grateful for, you know, and, and just what things wouldn't you change in your life that you really appreciate. You know, and just to try and focus on the now. Don't, don't be trying to think too far ahead in the future. You think if your head's too far in the past, it's just like going to be a stuck record. Just concentrate on the now and try and be as positive as you can. Flood yourself with positivity. Just if you're sitting there right now, just start telling yourself you are, you're this, you're that, you're great, you're fantastic. You know, and sooner or later, your body will start believing it and your mind will start accepting it. You know, I, I think just little little things that could help here and there. I'd try that. Fair play, brother. And yeah. Excited to see what you do for the future. Yeah. I believe you'll get a world title. Um, so, yeah, thanks for coming on today, giving me your time to tell your story. It's very much appreciated. And um, God bless you, brother. Yeah, thanks, thanks for having you. me. Check out more of my podcasts on the right and be sure to like, share and comment your thoughts on this week's podcast. Thank you.